I am going to talk to you about hate and extremism in the U.S. today. The Southern Poverty Law Center, as you know, tracks and monitors hate and extremism groups and have done so since the late 1980s. I, as I was preparing for today's talk, I just wanted to look back because it's always important to know, for me, to know what's happening right now. Because hate and extremism is such a constant in the U.S., I don't want to ever run the chance of saying, oh, that happened last year, uh, or that happened 10 years ago, or that happened 20 years ago. I really want to talk about what is happening now so that you know that it's a very real issue in this country. So then less than four months ago, about three months ago, within the span of 10 days, four terrorist acts took place in the United States. Four. On October 24th, Gregory Bush, 51 years old, tried to enter a, a black church in Kentucky. He likened himself to the terrorist Dylan Roof who went into a, um, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and massacred nine African American parishioners. He tried to do that. Fortunately, the, the doors to the church were, were, were locked and the guard was on a break and not available. Otherwise, he would have gotten in. Frustrated, he went to the local Kroger supermarket and was determined to kill some African Americans that day, and that he did. And not just kill them, he executed them. He literally executed two people at a Kroger's grocery store, just outside of Louisville. 69-year-old Maurice Stollard, um, Mr. Bush just makes his way into the, into the Kroger. It's Kentucky, so it's an open carry state. He has, his, he has his sidearm on. Just walks through, finds him, shoots him in the head, execution style. He fell, and he, sh he continued to riddle him with bullets. Walked out, went through the parking lot, saw an African-American African woman, 67-year-old Vicki Lee Jones, saw her in the parking lot, assassinates her as well. Just keep walking, calm as day, and through the parking lot, um, a white person happened to see him in the parking lot and said, hey, what's going on? And what does Mr. Bush say? Don't shoot me. Whites don't shoot whites. Then he was arrested. Two days later, October 26, Caesar Sayoc, 56 years old, was arrested and accused of sending pipe bombs, 13 pipe bombs, to critics of President Trump. You may remember that whole kind of frightening couple of weeks where people were getting um, firebombs delivered to their house. Former Attorney General Eric Holder, former U.S. President Barack Obama, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, philanthropist George Soros, to name a few. So they finally figured out that there was this Cesar Sayoc who was responsible. The next day, Robert Brown, Barnes, Bowers, I'm sorry, 46 years old, burst into the church, or the synagogue rather, in Pittsburgh, the Tree of Life Synagogue. Burst in, before he did though, he wrote on his social media page that I'm going in. Screw the optics, I'm going in. So he, he invades the synagogue in Pittsburgh yelling, all Jews must die. Then he proceeds to kill 11 people. 11 people. The country seemed right, rightfully mournful at the time, and I'm just lingering on it now because we seem, to, we seem to move on too quickly, or I think we move on too quickly. That's just totally my call, my judgment call. I think we move on too quickly. So let me say again, he burst into Tree of Life Synagogue shouting, all Jews must die, and 11 congregants die. Six other people were wounded, including, including four law enforcement officers who went in. A couple days after that, Scott Borelli, you may not recognize his name, 40 years old. He was recently fired from his job as a substitute teacher because he was, he was looking at porn in the classroom. 
which he had been fired before, but still for some reason was able to, to serve as a substitute teacher. He shoots and kills two women at a yoga class in Tallahassee. Do you remember hearing about that? This was all within the span of 10 days. I'd understand if you didn't remember one or the other because they're all horrific acts, but it's important to remember that these things happened. Within a 10 day period, Nancy, Nancy Van Vessum, which I, want, I think it's important to say the people's name, she was 61 and Maura Brinkley was 21. Four other women were injured that day, including one who was pistol whipped before the shooter decides to kill himself. Some say that the, um, the horrific affair that happened at, at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh was just shocking. The Washington Post says, and I agree, it was inevitable. It was the deadliest attack on Jewish community members in the United States, ever. And I didn't know that. And I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit cynical, but I was like, really? Certainly there was something more horrific than that. But yeah, nope, this is it. There were signs, though, that it's coming. The ADL recently, just, just a couple of weeks ago, put out their um, information or their research about hate and, hate and bias incidents happening across the United States. So the ADL reports a 57% increase in anti-Semitic hate and bias incidents during the year 2000. That's close to 2,000 individual incidents. And college campuses were up 89%, or incidents of, of anti-Semitic hate was up 89%. And in K-12 schools, up 94%. Why I think it's inevitable is because we begin to see signs of anti-Semitism or kind of more emboldened um, anti-Semitism way back in 2016 when we began to see the desecration of Jewish cemeteries across the country and mostly in your area in the, in the Northeast. Seven times um, Jewish cemeteries and, and graves were desecrated. Pennsylvania, New York, two in Connecticut and one in, in Massachusetts. And honestly, there is nothing worse, I think, other than killing people, I guess, than desecrating someone's resting place. But this, is, this has become routine. People running through cemeteries, drawing swastikas. And it got more, not, not more than a, hmm, oh, that's interesting, from the collective society. These are signs, hate incidents like this are signs of hate crimes to come. The swastika is a, is a symbol of Nazi Germany, it's a symbol of anti-Semitism and it's a symbol of white supremacy. It's not to be ignored. The majority of uh, bias incidents, anti-Semitic bias incidents that have taken place over the last few years all involve the swastika. It's a symbol. They're trying to tell you something and we need to pay attention. There's of course, and this is not a, you know, um, um, oppression, you know, Olympics or fighting for kind of who's number one. But at the same time that we're experiencing an increase in uptick in anti-Semitism, we're also experiencing, continue to experience an increase in anti-Muslim or Islamophobic bias. This is a synagogue in Florida that was firebombed and torched. It's not the only one. Just recently, another synagogue in, um, I mean a mosque rather, in Tennessee, Murfreesboro, you might recognize Mur Murfreesboro, home of the Klan, was, was torched there as well. And it's not just the torching of mosques, not even allowing mosques to be built in some communities, community members fighting back and saying, no, we don't even want it in our community. To increase, um, the proliferation of anti-Sharia law legislation that happens across the country. These are our elected officials who are introducing legislation known as anti-Sharia law to fight no Sharia law in the books. Not once 
has Sharia law been introduced in any place across the United States? Yet we have hundreds of pieces of legislation that have been introduced to fight Sharia law. And that's just a tactic to kind of whip up and continue to foment the otherness of Muslims or scare people into thinking that they're trying to take over. Sharia law will become the law of the land and it will never happen. But groups like Act for America want you to think that it will. And we're falling for it. There's the Muslim ban. There's um, op opposition to refugees of all kind, or refugee resettlement. And when we hear refugee resettlement, most people think Syrians or Middle Easterners or Muslims. And we don't want to have anything to do with that. And we know now that the shooter at the Tree of Life Synagogue chose the Tree of Life Synagogue because they had just had a program supporting refugee resettlement. What we, what we usually see are, are incidents like this as they relate to anti-Muslim or Islamophobic um, hate and bias incidents. And I think we've become num numb to that as well. But I came across this story and it was really interesting because, to me because it put it, in a, it put it in a different light for me. This woman who lives outside of Dallas and her mother were just walking down the street and they were attacked because they were wearing a hijab or a headscarf. They were yelled at. The, the, the women tried to ignore the attackers. Another woman tried to ignore the attackers, but that wasn't good enough for the attackers. Then the, attack, the attacker went to pull her headscarf off. The young woman, the woman seen here, went to protect her mother. She still didn't hit back, but she said, stop talking to my mother like that. Don't talk to my mother like that. And these are the indignities that observant Muslim women have to put up with every day. And she talked about in this article about how that felt to see her mother humiliated in front of her and how it felt for her to be humiliated in front of her daughter in that way. And nothing as of yet has happened to the alleged attacker. You may have missed this story. I'm talking about, still talking about hate, present day hate in the US. Four US citizens were arrested, charged with plotting to attack a Muslim community in upstate New York, just like near the Catskills, I, I'm told. Three adults, one 16-year-old, they had access to 23 rifles and shotguns and three homemade explosives were found at the home of the 16-year-old. Someone at school, thank goodness, a, a classmate of the 16-year-old overheard him t talking about um, a possible attack, and he told the authorities, which is the only reason why this was stopped. This community, it's called Islamburg. It was founded in the 80s. And it's primarily the, the, the African, or African American Muslims are the ones that primarily live there. Not the, not the typical stereotype that we think about when we think of Muslims but African-American Muslims, which are the highest um, Muslim population in the United States. So they moved there to, to escape crime and overcrowding in New York and have been attacked ever since. Back in 2015, a Tennessee man had, um, was convicted of, of a plot to bomb Islamburg, and then it was on. So anti-Muslim incidents from 2012 to the present number about 800. Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiment is higher today than it was post 9-11. And 9-11 was in 2001. It continues to grow. Oops, sorry. Um, I think sometimes lost in, in the talk of um, hate crimes, because 
I don't think it's purposeful or anything. But we sometimes lose track of just, just good old fashioned American racism against black people, which continues to exist. We didn't call it, right? we didn't call it a hate crime you know, when it first began. We don't typically call it a hate crime today. But African Americans and increasingly um, Latinx people are targeted most for racially, um, racially biased hate crimes and hate incidents. You may have missed this story about this guy who pleaded guilty to wanting to start a race war. You may remember the story. This guy was in, lived in Maryland, decided to go to New York because he wanted to get media attention. And he's like, I'm gonna kill a bunch of black men and this will start a race war and I will have the attention of the media because New York is the media capital of the world. So he goes, finds an older African-American man and kills him. Timothy Kaufman, 66 years old, who was collecting um, cans, recycled cans. And this guy, James Jackson, who's 30 years old, pulls out a knife, a, a, sword, a sword rather, and repeatedly stabs him. Turned himself in proudly, fully admitted to what he did and what his intentions were. And as you can see from this news article, pleaded guilty in court and was just fine with it. This is what is frightening to me now. As I spoke about the emboldenment that has taken place in this country. And the Southern Poverty Law Center, who's, as I mentioned, has been tracking and monitoring this for some time. We definitely see um, the uptick as connected to the 2016 presidential election, the presidential campaign. And um, though the Southern Poverty Law Center is a nonpartisan organization, you know, we are, we're an equal opportunity um, organization when it comes to tracking hate. And I will remind you when then candidate Trump entered the 2016 presidential campaign coming down that gold escalator, the first thing he did was to vilify and dehumanize Mexicans. That's how he started. They're rapists. They're bringing drugs. Then it went on to, we need a wall. Then he, then he started the Muslim ban. This dehumanizing rhetoric that passes for campaign, I don't know, campaign rhetoric is responsible for the increase in hate and, extreme, and extremist activities in this country today. Make no mistake about it, they're connected. I don't get into a debate about whether it's hate speech or free speech, all I know is Increased rhetoric that targets a particular segment of the population produces an increase in hate crimes that, are tar that target that same population. And whoever, um, whoever delivers that message, that hate rhetoric, is responsible. The president, above all, because he has the largest bully pulpit of all. I think that folks began to put it together when we, when we had the boldest show of, of white supremacy in this country in 2017 in Charlottesville, when neo-Nazis marched through the street proudly spouting neo-Nazi slogans, blood and soil, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, torches reminiscent of clan, of clan rallies, people out proud and bold, And our president saying that there were good people on both sides. There are no two sides to, to this. There's no good side or a bad side. This is not hard. It's not hard to figure out what it is that you're supposed to do. I know that this, this symposium is, is, um, in, is to encourage you to talk about how to build communities of dig dignity and respect and how to engage in these conversations but I guess I just need to tell you, it's not hard to be right, to do right. It's not hard. You should not have to be persuaded by some intellectual argument that people and every person should be treated with dignity and respect. 
I don't care if you never lived with them. I didn't. I grew up in Oakland, um, <laughs> and I'm so glad about it. <laughs> and I have to say, it's not easier for me to to treat to treat people who are not like me with dignity and respect than it is for you. But I think sometimes people think it's easier for people of color to do that, and in particular black people. It's not any easier. I make an effort, and I need you to make that effort too. Sorry, I'm getting, get, get distracted. <laughs> I was supposed to talk to you about what about the demographic shifts that are, that are fueling this increase in hate and extremism. And it is, as was said in the earlier panel, people are using the demographic shifts to justify their hate. That's all. Trying to put out a false narrative that demographic shifts, white folks becoming, becoming a numeric minority in this country, trying to tie that to some, some plot, some conspiracy to strip white people of social, economic, and political power in this country. First of all, that's not happening, regardless of the demographic shifts. You need to know that white people still maintain most of the social, political, and economic power in this country, and will continue to do so past the economic the demographic shift. White supremacy and classism is just that, that powerful. So there's no worry about that. Looking at 1970, the country looked like the 83% white, 17% people of color. And I like to say that's the way America likes its diversity. Nice strong majority, a little bit of something so I can enjoy myself, but not too much. It's not like that anymore, and it hasn't been like that for some time. So now it's closer to 66, and these are, these are low numbers now, 66% white, 34% people of color. And when that happens, you start seeing um, street signs in different languages, you start hearing different languages, you start seeing different people, you go back to your old neighborhood and it looks completely different, and then you look them and say, what? Who are these people? And where are the people that look like me? That's the tipping point for this demogra demographic shift. The U.S. Census reported in 2010 um, that first announcement that, that whites would no longer hold a numeric majority by 2050, they said, first. Then they quickly adjusted to 2040. They also, that same year, announced that people could begin to rightfully, I say, identify as biracial and multiracial. It was a big year for the census in 2010. Lots of stuff happened. And people were paying attention. And that's when people begin to get weird. <laughs> but demographic shifts, as I like to point out, have been happening for some time. And, and if we look at it through the lens of age, maybe you could see it a little clearer. Because if you look at if the, the population in the United States 55 and over, it's still 75% white. That's why you, when you see that, you're, not, you're seeing the truth in, ha in halls of power or at the airport or wherever you see white folks, <laughs> older white folks. It's because you still have the majority, 75% to 25%. Take 10 years off of that and it changes pretty dramatically, right? And this is now, this is the now. 61%, 61.5% white, 38.5% people of color for ages 35 through 54. That's a fact. Take it down some more. People aged 18 to 34, almost half. That's your college age demographic. And then if you look at it 18 and under, it's over. Over, I'm telling you, over. <laughs> so there's nothing else to worry about. It's already a wrap, as I say. The, um, <laughs> the, the demographers will tell you that, um, well, they told us years ago, I think but maybe five or six years ago, that white students became a minority in K-12 public schools eh, six, seven years ago. That's a pretty good marker. Also, live births were down. The, the growth in the white community is about 
It's about the same in the um, African American community, for those who, who, I say that so you don't get frightened. <laughs> the African American community is about 12 to 14 percent of the population nationally, and that's all we're going to be. Maybe go up to 18 percent, maybe, but doubtful. The largest growing um, racial ethnic group in the country are Asian and Pacific Islanders, and will continue, that will continue to be the case. Latinx people have a little bit of a head start, so we'll have some majority, but nobody is going to have um, a majority before 2050 or 2060. Nobody. So it gives us some time. It doesn't have to be bad. Like this guy, Andrew Anglin, the publisher of Daily Stormer, which is like the most reviled, awful, anti-Semitic, racist, white supremacist website out there. He's a publisher, and he calls it the Daily Stormer as a rift for um, um, a, a publication that existed in Germany during Nazi Germany, to Stormer, to Stormer. Anyway, Andrew Anglin is, is one of those that are out there pushing the false narrative that there's a conspiracy afoot, a white genocide just around the corner trying to get rid of white people. And he pushes these lies and these false narratives on the website, and folks just eat it up. People like those, uh, Mr. Bush and those people who, who engaged in the, the killing at, um, in Pittsburgh and the killing in, in, in Kentucky, it's not just college students or members of the so-called alt-right that believe this crap. It's older people who should definitely know better who believe this. Because it's also pushed again by the administration. But since we're on a college campus, and I want, I want you all to, to have some of the latest information about the so-called alt-right, you may not have heard about them for a while, but they're still operating. Richard Spencer, who coined the term the alt-right, um, has, has, has been on a little bit of a hiatus. He had a college tour planned and it wasn't fun anymore, as he said, and so he took a step back. But you best believe he will be back, and he still operates online. So the alt-right is a loose set of far-right ideologies organized around white nationalism. White nationalism are, are, are folks who advocate for a white ethnic state. They want a white ethnic state. And Richard Spencer and anybody who, who believes in white nationalism is, is proud to say that. We don't give them this label. They earn the label after saying that's what they want. White people should be here. We should just have carve out this country, have our place here, and y'all have that place there. That's white nationalism. White supremacy is a belief in a philosophy that animates the entire thing. That believes in the false, false racial hierarchy of white folks. That's white supremacy. <clears throat> white nationalism is a political system. So anyway, um, they continue to believe that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the, the Immigration Act of 1965 were plots against Western civilization. And, and who was behind that plot? The Jews. So white nationalists don't care if, white, if Jews are white. They believe that they're responsible for manipulating all of the things that happen. We have, we have too many immigrants. It's the Jews' fault. We have too, too gay rights. Jews. Black rights. Black Lives Matter. It's all the Jews manipulating the whole system. And that's how anti-Semitism animates white nationalism. They're connected. So you got Richard Spencer, Andrew Anglin, Mike Ennick. These are people who um, run websites or run radio, uh, podcasts, and people follow them. The primary groups that are on college campuses pushing white nationalism are Identity Europa that started in California. In 2015, I believe, they haven't even existed that long. One white guy, former veteran, decided to start this group. He's the one that came up with the term, you will not replace us. He started this group, and it has just taken off. And Identity Europa is responsible for the majority of posters and flyers and banner drops that you see on college campuses. Identity Europa. They post these pictures that look at, um, or, or, or uh, 
I don't know, celebrate Western civilization. They have lots of pictures of, of Michelangelo's David. They look pretty innocuous, but they're also very triggering. They're the ones that put out the poster, it's okay to be white. And what Identity Europa does and what Patriot Front does, because they, they, they know it works, they put these posters up and then they just sit back and watch y'all get triggered. And they just wanna start confusion. And they wanna be able to say that, see, they don't like white people, I told you. See how they're reacting? All I said was it's okay to be white. It's also a way, the primary way that they recruit on campus. So they're not as innocuous as they would have you to believe. But they do thrive on the attention that they get from you and how they can trigger you. So they trigger college students, they trigger <coughs> Antifa or anti-fascist, and then you get these, then you get these clashes, and then it looks like they're good people or bad people on both sides. So don't let them trigger you. Don't let them steal the narrative. They also, students, you should know this. They also target professors. Professors that are deemed too liberal or too progressive are targeted and put on a list and vilified across the country. And they try to get, um, <clears throat> take their jobs. There's some campus organizations that have been propping up, white student unions. They started first in Townsend University in Maryland in 2014. There's one in Auburn in Alabama. And it's a recognized student club, a white student union, because they say, oh, you have a black student union, we should be able to have a white student union. This is how they're making further and further inroads and in how some people are believing them. But I need you to know that far, the far right, and somebody said it earlier too, the far right movement and those white nationalist ideologies or white supremacist ideologies are responsible for more deaths of American citizens than any foreign jihadists. <clears throat> They've killed more people since 9-11 than any other category of domestic extremism, any. In 2017, Muslim extremists had seven attacks, far left extremists had 11 attacks, and the far right, which included anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, anti-government, produced 77 deaths. That's just the truth. Between 2008 and 2017, 71% of extremist-related fatalities in the U.S. were committed by members of the far right or white supremacist movements. Not, white, um, not black separatist identity groups that um, former Attorney General, um, what's his name? <laughs> From Alabama, uh, Sessions tried to tell you about. It's white folks, and we don't even want to call them, we don't want to call them domestic terrorists, and they are, and have no problem recognizing how, how other folks get radicalized online. White young men are getting radicalized online today. And you need to face it so that you can stop it. There was a 17% increase in the number of hate crimes over the last year. It sounds like a lot. It's underreported. <clears throat> hate crimes are notoriously underreported. The Department of Justice says that about mm, 7,000, 8,000 hate crimes existed last year or were committed last year. And it's underreported because jurisdictions do, are not required to report hate crime information. And sometimes when they do, they report zero, like Charlottesville. Even though Heather Heyer was killed, they reported that zero hate crimes took place in Charlottesville. There's no check. The number is closer to <clears throat> 250,000 acts of hate and bias that happen annually in the United States. So don't get distracted by that. We um, at the center track hate and extremist groups and their leaders more so than the individual acts of, um, acts of bias and hate incidents. So you can go to our website. We're, we're launching or yeah, the, the information, the hate map for 2018 launches on, I think, the 21st of this month. But I have a preview for you that there, there are 1,020 active hate groups in the United States in 2018, or there were. 
We're always looking back a year. So as you can see from this graph, it was a, it's about a 5% increase over last year's numbers of 954. And it's been on a steady climb since 2014. We're getting better at, at um, tracking and monitoring th these things, but there's definitely an increase. There's an increase, in, and I'm coming to a close because, and this ties to, to one of the questions that somebody asked earlier. I don't call it intersectionality. I just call it, I don't know what I call it. I just want us to pay attention to what's going on. Because even though there's an increase in hate and extremist group, there's an increase in, in, in people becoming radicalized online, there's an increase in white nationalist policies at the federal level. And that's what we need to be concerned about as well. And one of those, the, 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 soon they won't need to have hate groups or, or anti-immigrant groups because the policies designed by Stephen Miller, anti-immigrant zealot, will be completely in line with white nationalist agenda. And that's what we have to pay attention to as well. So when the Trump administration says that, oh my God, there's a migrant caravan on the way, this was, this, this, this kid, this family, these people, or that scary caravan. I'm trying to get coffee this morning at the, the hotel, the, the TV's on, who's on, but you know, Sanders. <laughs> Huckabee, not that, not the other Sanders. Um, talking about, oh my God, yeah, just yesterday, there was an attack by M13, MS13. We have to stop believing that, right? We have to start pushing back on that. This, this is what the migrant car caravan looks like. And as, and as someone said earlier, people are coming here because of things that we've done in their country that have pushed them out. We can, we can vilify people and dehumanize people call them gang members, call them drug dealers, dehumanize them, and then it makes it possible for you to tear gas them. Because they're nobody. They're dangerous. You've already dehumanized them. And that dehumanization process allows you to treat them any kind of way. Just, just bomb them, just kill them, who cares? I was reading something about the number of deaths and um, ICE detention. People don't care. Well, they shouldn't have brought the kids here in the first place, I think is what our president said. This is on us, on all of us. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the, the, the increase or the, 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 the continued attacks on black and brown transgender women that just happens and we don't even talk about it. Transgender women of color are like targeted like no other group. And I don't think we're paying attention to that either. What you need to pay attention to is the regression in LGBTQ rights that are happening in this country. Now we have, now trans people can't serve openly in the military. How'd that happen? Well, if you allow for the people to be killed, you don't, you don't allow for, for people to be themselves and grant them agencies, agency over their own lives, you can withhold, they don't deserve any rights. And people who kill them certainly can't be held responsible. And I guess I'm talking mostly to, to black and brown people. These are our people and we have to pay attention. These are our family members. Oops, I already had you, Enid, sorry. Um, so, let's pay attention. This is not new, sadly. It's not new. Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, talks about the, how slavery never ended, it just evolved. The whole system of hate and intolerance never ended. It just evolves and changes and changes targets. And unless and until we go back, all the way back, 
and, uh, and untangle that and see how we were, how our founding was made on hate and genocide and intolerance. We won't be able to fix it now. So I'm all about like looking at, at the history and figuring out how, what we're gonna do in the present. So I wanted to leave you with this Audre Lorde quote. There's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. And as I close, I wanna go back to those four guys that led that 10 days of terror. Because it wasn't just the people that they targeted in that particular incident. The guy, the misogynist, incel, involuntary celibate, also made videos attacking black people. Um, Mr. Bowers, who was responsible for the Tree of Life synagogue, he also vilified and hated Black Lives Matter. Mr. Say Sayok, who did the pipe bombings, he has online activity that mocks queer people. And then the guy at Kroger, do you know he was married to a black woman? Did you know that? <laughs> so, I'll just leave that there. So that's the state of hate and intolerance um, in the U.S. today. There's a lot, and I didn't even talk about all of it. But remember that it's, 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 it is on the increase, and that doesn't even matter. All you need to know that is that, is that it exists. And you and I and each one of us has the power to change that. It's not going to be somebody else. It's going to be us. I mentioned that people have become more emboldened. We, us, have to push that back, push back against that. No, not in my space. You will not talk about these people. You will not vilify these people. No, that's not political discourse. No, that's not listening to both sides of the argument. I will not have it. That's what each of us can do. So this is the Civil Rights Memorial that is at, uh, sits in front of the office building of the Southern Poverty Law Center. It includes this quote that Dr. King um, delivered at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, 1963 in Washington, D.C. Most people remember um, Dr. King's speech that day as the I Have a Dream, oh, so beautiful in the children. <laughs> and it was. But he started off with this little ditty. It was a paraphrase from the book of Amos. And it starts, no, we will not be satisfied. No, sorry. No, we are not satisfied. And we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And that's kind of where we need to be, people. Can't be satisfied. Even if it looks good for you and it's good for you, it's not good for somebody else. You saw the images of the, the, the kids that are coming over, you know, to live. You saw images of, trans, of the parents of a transgender woman who was murdered. You, you know about what happened at the Tree of Life synagogue. You know what happened at the grocery store. You can't be satisfied. You can't and you have to figure out what it is that you can do and you have to figure it out now. No time, now. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm really grateful for your talk um, and I wanna pick up on a couple of things you said at the end there. So it's personal, right? I think a lot of us are having sort of questions that are really personal. So I come from a Jewish family. We've survived pogroms, we've survived the Holocaust. And I'm watching my father and my grandmother fall into right-wing rhetoric. Mm. So I want to complicate and I want to know what you think because I can't understand. So part of it, I think, has to do with a libertarian streak, a sort of I don't trust the establishment, which comes from being tossed out of every country you've been in for centuries, right? And so then that libertarian streak meets this right-wing fake news rhetoric and I'm getting emails uh, you know, from my father, I'm a genocide scholar, saying, that, you know, what do you think of this white genocide in South Africa? And I'm uh, horrified mm -hmm. and 
try to educate him on what the meaning of genocide is and what the reality of the numbers are of, of who's actually being killed in South Africa. Um, and then I'm getting, you're being PC, and then I go back and I say, you're reading what Trump is reading, and then I get, I refuse to speak to you. <laughs> that sounds and, about right. Right? And I'm like, I, wow, wow, but you are, I'm like, I just stated a fact. You're reading what Trump is reading. So there's like a disavowal of Trump, yes. but an embracing. And that's something that I do think is new and is making hate, you know, that, that's what I would love your, your insights into on how it becomes normalized through these, we'll accept that, but we disavow that, and how do we make sense of it? Well, one, and someone mentioned this earlier too, is that uh, members of the Jewish community are being manipulated through this whole thing, right? So people on the far right will give, give Jews the impression that, you know, we're all about Jews, we're all about Israel, we're all about that, so that y'all can go over there, right? That's what that's about. Let's just be clear. Because Jesus reigns here, y'all go there. So we'll support you in that effort, anything to, to get you back to your homeland, right? So but as far as your dad, though, all I was thinking was, oh, my God, like, you got to take him to some progressive synagogue. Like, you gotta, he's got to be in a place where he can kind of, you know, be intellectually challenged again. It sounds like, I mean, because that, that, that's what is going to pull him out of it. Libertarianism, it. libertarianism is a slippery slope to the, to the far right. We've seen it with all of these guys, these, these young guys who are now leading the alt-right movement, all started as libertarians. Right. And so, also, and it doesn't happen on its own. People have to be willing to say, it's, it's that selfish thing, I'm okay, and my stuff is okay, and something is wrong with these people. And so you have to continue to challenge that and push back against that. Don't get in an intellectual debate with them. Like, why? What is it that you have against these people? Like, push them to the edge so he can admit whatever, whatever his prejudice thing is, right? Because all the rest is bullshit, right? So get them to, get them to like, say it. And then maybe you could have a conversation. But don't try to have a false intellectual conversation about like we're both dealing with facts here you know when we're not like what's your thing yeah what you got against black people in south africa <laughs> i don't know just get to the truth of it and then take them take them to, to temple somewhere that where they're having good conversations <laughs> thanks hi my name is deborah i loved your talk and i love the work that the southern poverty law center does so thank you for that um, I'm always nervous when I have to talk at a mic in crowds, so um, I'm forgetting the exact case that I'm thinking about, but somebody was just sentenced for trying to blow up a mosque uh, in 2016, and his defense was that he was just following the words of Trump. Mm -hmm. You know the one I'm talking about? It just... Was yes, in, I believe it was the guy in Tennessee. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either ten, I was thinking either Tennessee or Georgia, but so he used that as his defense. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lot of that happening now, that people are saying, look, I'm just following the orders of my leader. And I'm just wondering, with all of the different law cases that the Southern Poverty Law Center has been involved with, is there any case to be made there? Is there any sort of effort to take the rhetoric and saying that this is more than just free speech, but this is a direct line to the escalation and violence? And if there's anything you can do with that? Well, we can't. There, we, it, there's nothing to litigate over. All we can do and what we've been trying to do is to, to get that word out and to amplify that and to, to get that to policy leaders, to journalists, to get the media, and to people to say, look, he's saying this, this X happens, he says X, and Y happens. And so trying to, to, to be consistent about putting that message out when that's true. And not just him, like Stephen King or whoever, or, or Miller or whoever saying this thing. You can't, you can't sue them because, um, you know, they have a right to say whatever they want. But we have to keep them respond. We have to keep them responsible, right? And paint the picture for people so that they know. And every time somebody says, "Well, I did it because of Trump," this guy, the the pipe bomb guy. I mean, he was all about Trump. You, that, his van was just just full of stickers and you know that doesn't get him out of that doesn't get him a get out of jail free card um so we just have to continue to paint the picture that's all the time we have oh what come 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 <laughs> thank you so much for being here um so all i hear is um um 
that we don't have we don't have love mm -hmm. so um we're hateful and we are confused um i think that the essence is love and um personally every day i intentionally try to um be nice and you know go out of my way to build community um and you know accept differences learn um to you know be in community so uh how do we how do we do that how do we each of us um can every day build this community and come together and you know fight this hate i think we follow your lead that's just a beautiful thing what you said i'm so glad that you came <laughs> up thank you <laughs> you know i mean I don't know if you all heard that um, Jesse Smolt, who was attacked, you know, in Chicago last week, that's what he said when he, he in his per first public statement, he's like, it's just all about love. And um, it sounds, you know, it sounds kind of whatever, but that is true. I mean, we have to be active about it. So I'll pick up on something that somebody else said about being in, um, people often talk about, oh, college, you know, this is the most diverse place that anybody's ever been in. Okay, well, take advantage of it. Take advantage of it and push yourself through your discomfort. Let me address the other person who said, well, I don't know, well, what should I do? You make your confession first, and then maybe we can have a, like, a conversation. Don't wait to get busted like the, the governor, right? Because that's a wholly different thing. It's a wholly different conversation. When you come to me and say, God, Lisha, you know, we're talking about this stuff, and you know, yeah, my grandfather, but okay, that's a different conversation. But if you wait and get busted out, and then like, oh, don't, don't come at me, don't, don't, don't. No, no, it's totally different. When you're, it's not about being a racist or not being a racist, it's about being actively anti-racist or supporting a racist system. You, you're doing one or the other. And so I think that your thing about love would fall on actively anti-racist. Being neutral is falling on supporting a racist system. And, and the sooner you know that, the better. You don't. You don't get off just because you're studying. <laughs> okay. Thank you.